What's going on, guys? Sensible Prepper Live. We're here with Robbie Wheaton from Wheaton Arms. Uh, been a gunsmith for over 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> we had it wild when we first came in. Um, been a gunsmith for over 20 years, and he does a lot of really great custom work. They also has um, Glock aftermarket parts, and they supply all the upgrades of the Palmetto State Armory Dagger, officially. That's what they use. So uh, if you're looking for a great trigger for your Glock, this is the guy to see. The flat face trigger is phenomenal. Also threaded barrels yep. for Glocks and <clears throat> lots of other stuff. So check out Wheaton Arms. And great to have you with us. Great to be here. Great to have you with us. Um, also, Sarah Mack, she will be over uh, monitoring the questions. If you have any questions and you can uh, submit those questions at any time. And so we'll take a break and you can ask those questions. It doesn't necessarily have to be related to what we're talking about, but at least toward prepping <laughs> or maybe some firearms. Yep. Yep. But, and for those of you that enjoy the episode today, uh, I'll be continuing this tonight at 6 p.m. Eastern on my YouTube channel, Robbie Wheaton. You can search for it over there. And uh, we'll be talking about body armor and some of the new updated standards, firearms, and we can continue some of the discussion from today. And that is hit the link to his channel is down below in the description. It's Robbie Wheaton. Boom. Also, we want to give a big thank you to Exotac, who makes some of the best fire starters on the market. And they're down in Winder, Georgia. I mean, they just go a step above and they are my very favorite fire starting tools. And you really need to have a fire kit, guys. And Exotac is a great place to start. And they give a 20% discount using Suits 20. That's with, hot. With the link down below. It is real hot. It's hot. <laughs> It'll keep you warm. And today we've had weather that we needed to keep Ooh, warm. Man. <laughs> I'll tell you, stocking stuffer. That's a great oh, stocking that, that's stuffer. That's a great right idea. There. That's a great idea. Yep. In fact, that's a really good idea. Yeah. I may be using that one. <laughs> but uh, guys, today we're going to talk about something that was inspired from an article I read on Fox News. And it was about people that were preparing, uh, but they didn't want to be preppers. They're not trying to be doomsday mm -hmm. preppers. <clears throat> They're just wanting to have some things put back. They see some things that are going on in the country and they think, you know, it'd be good to have a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And so we're going to really talk today to non-preppers. Now, this list obviously folds right into the prepping community. Uh, but, you know, the prepping community is not just one thing. And one thing I think that a lot of people see, with especially with people that are more doomsday preppers, is that you know, they, they, they just completely encompass their life with prepping yep. and the idea of prepping. <clears throat> Why wouldn't you want a bunker? I'm, well, I mean, I mean, I'm I mean just what saying, in the world? I'm just saying. Why wouldn't you want a bunker? <laughs> well, Everybody should you? have at least one. At least one. At least yes, one. at least one bunker. But, you know, other than that, <laughs> does not everybody have a bunker? I know, right? You know, back during the Cold War, of course, obviously, a lot of people were encouraged and a lot of people were concerned. And a lot of bunkers were built during mm -hmm. that time. Uh, and but we're looking at just plain and simple. What do I need to do just to get myself a little more prepared for emergencies, right. things that are happening? Uh, now, this isn't just for storms. Uh, you know, there's a number of things that people are concerned about. Now, let me give you this this uh, statistic, which I thought was really interesting. Of course, in 2020, 21, uh, prepping was massive and pe people that had never thought about prepping, obviously, because you know, of the pandemic. So a it lot was of people, an opening year. It was a big opening year for a lot of people. And, it was. and I think really highlighted the fact that we could run out of things that we use on a normal day to day basis very quickly, very easily. You know, toilet paper, for example. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, even food and going yep. to the grocery and seeing mm -hmm. shelves empty. Yep. But also it's funny, about 29 percent of Americans currently are regularly purchasing emergency items. And when I say regularly, they may just get a fire extinguisher and a couple of flashlights and some batteries. You know, I mean, it, it's a pretty generic uh, and pretty wide open category, but still about 29%. So one in three are actually thinking about preparedness. But what's interesting is, is millennials, when it comes to them, it's 39% of millennials are thinking more toward being prepared having some supplies on hand. Gen Z is 40%. So the younger generations are actually thinking more about preparedness mm -hmm. 
than, <clears throat> you know, the, the older generations. What well, the baby boomers are thinking about retirement. The Gen Xers are thinking about putting their kids through college. <clears throat> so, you know, they're, they're, I think there's different there's different priorities for, for different groups of people. Right. And two, a lot of times with millennials and Gen Zers, they're not, their kids haven't quite, or they're just getting into some sports and right. things. So they're, they're kind of taking some steps to, uh, to think about it, but you know, you look around the world and it's definitely, you know, interesting to say the least. Mm -hmm. I mean, where, whether it's war or possible war, whether it's definitely another type pandemic, whether it's, you know, we're, we're looking at our power grid right now, there's some, concerns about that. Yep. And then they grew up with civil unrest and with governmental or political problems and, and you know, a lot of confusion. Well, you know, you think about it, a lot of your millennials are, which, which ones are older or which millennials, ones are younger? The, the, the Gen Z is the youngest. Okay. So the majority of your Gen Zers have grown up with our country being at war. Yeah. It, with Afghanistan. That's and, right. and, but it was a war far away. You know, and yep. and now we're we're getting more into hey, we may be facing Russia, we may be facing China, Iran. Look at what's going on in Israel. Mm -hmm. But the the fact is, is it, it's just smart to be aware that the world is not a you know a bed of roses. And you know, there was a song by Bon Jovi. It said, "I want to lay on a bed of roses," but. Uh, you're putting me on a bed of nails. <laughs> and so, you know, the thing is, is to be aware. One thing though that, uh, and I do want to mention this is a lot of times with prepping and, and it's become a, a, a byword a lot of times, or, you know, survivalist or, or whatever you want to put in there, because they look at those people as being consumed and obsessed, uh, which you can be. And I just want to encourage you guys. I mean, if you're watching this channel, you know, typically you're interested in preparedness and, uh, survival. Don't get caught up in the it's too late. Don't ever get caught up in that. Don't get caught up in it's, you know, the world's coming to an end. It's doomsday or whatever. Now, be aware of what's going on. Monitor what's going on and don't just say, well, everything will work out because it doesn't always happen that way all throughout history. Uh, we've had a very great run at prosperity here yes. in the U.S. Yes, we have. But there are <clears throat> there are problems ahead and we need to be aware of them. Uh, the economy in itself is something that a lot of people are very concerned about. Yep. So first off, we just want to talk about some basics. Now, these are things that people will do that aren't necessarily prepper. It's just things they're going to use and they just want to have some extras. Yep. And so we're going to kind of look at it that way. This again is not about prepping. It's just being prepared. Sense. It's about being prepared. Yep. Just like the Boy Scouts. That's right. And you know, the Marine Corps, That's they right. were just prepared, just prepared. You're, <laughs> you're ready for whatever comes your way. They're ready for it. And you know, that's the real essence of being prepared mm -hmm. is to kind of give yourself some tools and then just be prepared and say, Hey, if this happens, you know, we've got some time. And yep. honestly, all this does, you know, whether it's, stocking up on supplies or whatever your food, water, whatever, is that you're giving yourself more time. You can't do it all. You you can't, unless you're going toward the homesteading, which mm -hmm. to me, a lot of people are. And I think that's really the, the, the true end to really being a true prepper. Well, I think that's what's driven up land prices across the country is more people, more and more people realize the importance of homesteading and providing for themselves and not being reliant on someone else to provide their, their food and everyday, everyday needs for them. Right. Well, with transportation, yep. you know, you've got to get that food to where you mm -hmm. are. And if you have that food right there, you're growing. Yes. It's a lot harder works a lot harder, but you know, it is something that I think if you are a true prepper and you've got stockpiles of stuff, I think the best thing to do is to kind of start thinking about moving toward more of a homestead type mentality. Okay. So, uh, we're going to go, we're going to kind of hit some, we're going to take a break and we're going to, so if you have your questions, please feel free and we'll get to the ones we can. Uh, so first off, let's just talk about food. That's one that, you know, a lot of people are concerned about and rightly so. It's my favorite. <laughs> it's my favorite. I love some food. Food is the favorite. <laughs> um, you know, and in the rule of threes, you can actually live three weeks generally without food. Um, and so, Food is vital. Food's important. It's going to give you energy. It's going to keep your morale up. Yep. It's going to keep you thinking instead of just being hungry and making rash decisions. So uh, a lot of people, though, 
what's in their pantry is just kind of what they're using on a weekly basis. Right. And they're kind of going through it and they go back to the grocery store and, and they're using those things. So first off is, is food is making sure that you have some extras. You know, I would highly recommend a month. Now, two weeks would be good, <laughs> but a month is really where you, you know, would be a great place to start to be more prepared. Well, you know, one of the big things with, with me, I love fresh fruits, fresh vegetables, fresh meat. So, you know, I, I'm at the grocery store three or four times a week getting fresh vegetables and fresh fruits. But when I go to the grocery store to get my fresh vegetables and my fresh fruits, I'm still getting long term food supplies as well. Dried rice, uh, dried beans, things that I can store up and put back in case I need them. Well, you know, and we I've been big about canned food for a mm -hmm. while. And, yep. you know, the thing is, is it stores forever. It'll mm -hmm. last forever. And it's something you can put back. You know, we could get into, oh, you need to start canning and dehydrating. That's not where these these new preppers are right. or people that are trying to be prepared. Yep. So, you know, just getting those basic things that you're already doing, mm -hmm. but thinking a little bit of long term. That's right. In, in the process and going, you know what? I don't, I'm going to have some Denny Moore beef stew and we'll just put some of it back, which it's not bad. Well, and here's the thing. You get a a snowstorm or a thunderstorm or, or like the people in Tennessee over the weekend with a tornado. Right. You know, their, their power grids down and they're talking about their power being down for weeks. Wow. And you know, that's, that's a SHTF situation for those people that live there right now. And, you know, they're having to look at their meals, their meal plans, how they're going to cook, what are they going to cook? Uh, a lot of them, where are they going to live because their homes were destroyed uh, or the roofs were ripped off of them. So that is a, that is a, definite SHTF situation that they're having to deal with right now. And having your, you know, if your home is fine, but you're out of, you're without power for the next three or four weeks, you're going to have to be able to cook. You're going to have to be able to, to be able to pr prepare your meals every day. Uh, a lot of the grocery stores were destroyed up there. So having long-term food supplies stored up is going to put you ahead of everyone else. That's going to be rushing to the grocery store as soon as it opens back up and trying to buy whatever they can off the shelves. That's true. And and they're going to be, you know, there with empty shelves yep. a lot of times because things <clears> are going to be picked over. That's right. So again, it just gives you, you're buying some time when you put these things together. So food and Robbie brought up a great point is that you've got to think about a way to cook. Now, sure, you can open up a can of corn and eat it. <laughs> and, you know, you can, but that's not the preferred way. So, you know, whether it's even you ever just sit a, on the bank fishing for trout. Yes, I've eaten corn put, like put that. Put some on the hook, scoop some out for yourself. Right. Especially when I had, we've been cleaning fish yeah. and I had that on my hands. That's right. Dip it. Yeah, it's yeah. really good. You got that protein with it. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, it, you can eat it. It's pre-cooked. But, you know, you want to have a way to heat food up and to cook food. And so there's, you know, it's just something to think about. A lot of us have grills. A lot of us have maybe camp stoves. Mm -hmm. You have something. Again, not going out and buying a whole bunch of stuff, but what have you got that you can use or that you will use in other ways? Right. So if you have a Coleman stove, hey, you're going to go camping or you like to camp or you have one of the little small, you know, butane stoves or whatever, camp stoves, uh, you know, it'll give you an option to cook and you want to have some fuel behind it. So kind of thinking these things out when you're just kind of doing some things to make yourself again, better prepared. Well, and one of the big things too is, you know, I, I love cooking on the grill. I love cooking on my griddle. Yeah. I'm, I'm a huge griddle fan, <laughs> but here, here's the thing. The, the griddle and the grill are awesome, but they use a lot of propane. If you're using a small little Coleman stove that you can hook your 20 pound propane bottle up to that 20, 20 pound bottle is going to last a lot longer on that little small Coleman camp stove than it will cooking on your big griddle or your big grill. Right. So how can you stretch point. your resources longer? Right. And so again, buying time. All right. Number two is water. And really number one is water, but number two, you know, it's kind of together, but water, you can only live three days without water. Yep. Uh, and, and again, that's a generalization in a sense, but whenever you're dehydrated, your body starts to cramp. I've done that before where we were at the range. It was a really hot day and my body would, my, my extremities will start to draw in and uh, it's not a good feeling. So you want to make sure that you, you have water, you know, your body is 80% water. 
So you want to make sure that you maintain some kind of water source, um, you know, even in a terrorist threat, which obviously that has been something that's been a concern for a lot of people. What did you see that in uh, Pennsylvania this past weekend? The, the water grid in Pennsylvania was hacked and uh, <clears throat> they were able through this, this hacking, they were able to shut down the water grid in, uh, in this county in Pennsylvania. Wow. And uh, it, it's, it hasn't made your mainstream media, but it's been a lot of the news resources that I look at. It's been all over those with this, uh, this uh, cyber attack. Yes. Yep. Wow. I didn't know that. So, you know, but water is something we have to have is something you have to have. And you may say, well, you know, we've got a river down here or we got a lake or a pond, but you do not want to drink water out of those water sources mm -hmm. that are not treated. So, you know, just putting back some water, but you need a gallon of water per person per day. So if you're going to look at a month, that's going to be a lot of water yeah. that you've got to put back. Uh, now, you can obviously have water purification tabs, and that's great. Uh, bleach is also chlorine bleach is a great way to be able to treat water. It kills Giardia and Cryptosporidium, which will could kill you but will definitely make you super sick. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So you need to be able to have a source for water and really having some water stored up is great, but that won't last that long. You know, you could have a couple of cases of the bottled water and right. go, well, I'm good to go. Well, you're good to go for a little bit. A couple sure. of days. And, and that'll give you that much. It'll give you some time to figure out your mm -hmm. water source. But, you know, that is one thing to consider is water is vital. And so making sure that you have a way to have some water stored up. And honestly, guys, I'm telling you for you to run around and go, well, I got a filter. I don't have to worry about it. But it's a lot of work. And the yeah. less work you have to do up front, the better, the more convenient. So having some water bottles put aside and then you can go into some, uh, some other water. But water is vital for all of us. Uh, and so water, number one, one gallon per person per day. Uh, and then we go to medical supplies, which obviously that is something that, you know, you need to have on hand. Typically, we have our common things that we need, yep. like our <clears throat> antacids or our emodiums and, and, you know, different things, Tums or whatever you might need for that. But what is it that you might need in a an emergency situation? A lot of people just go out and buy a first aid kit. Mm -hmm. People just, ah, oh, let's get a first aid kit. Because here's the thing, guys, a lot of these, a lot of people that are really just looking to prep are not getting into all the research. So let's get the basics. Now, to me, trauma kit is vital. Having a you know yep. tourniquet and chest seals and hemostatic gauze that'll stop the bleeding. And knowing how to use it. That's the big <laughs> thing. You know, there's a lot of people that have uh IFACs or, or, you know, trauma kits, but have no idea how to use any of the stuff that's in there. Yeah, that's true. And honestly, it's not that <coughs> difficult. It's no, not it's difficult. Not. If you get a little bit of training, it's not black magic. Uh, Red Cross, that's a great resource for, you know, a lot of different things toward, you know, whether it's honestly just your, um, you know, you're your, just your Red Cross going and, and learning how to do the Heimlich maneuver or, yep. you know, the resuscitation for someone who's had a heart attack or something. Yeah. So basic CPR. Yes. Yeah, CPR. Yep. That was what I was trying to <laughs> think. So I was picking up what you put down. That's why, that's why he's a good, good partner here. <laughs> but, you know, having some, some ideas on your medical and, and thinking it ahead of time, because medical can happen at any time mm -hmm. to anyone <clears throat> in any environment. Uh, you know, so having some kind of medical situation and two, you want to make sure you have some antibiotic ointment in case you cut yourself. Now, th does that mean that elect that emergency medical is not going to be around? Yep. Yeah, they'll be around, hopefully. But the problem is, is they may be overwhelmed. What happened during COVID? <clears throat> yeah. you know, the, the hospitals were overwhelmed with people. One thing that's really cool, though, lately is all the, the trauma centers that they've mm -hmm. opened up around. Yep. And there's a lot of, you know, places to be able to get treatment, not yes. necessarily just at your major hospital. Right. But still, you know, in, in an emergency emergency situation where it's in a widespread area, it could affect everybody. Um, we're going to go to one more and then we're going to we're going to go to some questions. Um, now, a survival bag. Now, we call them bug out bags, get home bag. You know, we have all these terms for it, but just a basic survival bag, something that just has some emergency supplies in mm -hmm. it. It has maybe a change of clothes and some socks. 
and that you have these things put aside. You have a way to start a fire if you need to. But here's the thing about fire, guys. And this is one reason why this is so important. This is a ferrocerium rod. It's a, a fire rod and you can strike it and it'll do 10,000 strikes. Matches are great, but, you know, sometimes lighters. I mean, you know, you're going to have your big lighter. But I want to give you a tip about big lighters, though, is this this little red little button can get depressed and you can lose all your fuel mm -hmm. or, you know, this uh, the striker itself sometimes can freeze up. And I found that big lighters, while they're the most convenient, they're the ones that will first go out on you. You know, one thing that I do with <coughs> with all of my big lighters, they've got the little safety tab on top that's supposed to prevent children from being able to play with fire. You know, <laughs> you know no child has ever played with fire. No, I never did. But I take a, a pair of needle nose pliers and I rip that little tab out of there because if your hands are cold or if your hands are wet, that little tab on there can make it very, very difficult to strike one of those lighters in an emergency situation. So I tear that little tab off to make it easier to strike the lighter. Right, right. That's a great idea. But, you know, having some lighters, I, when I go to the grocery a lot of times or I'm in a convenience store and they mm -hmm. have a little pack of lighters or they have one of the torch lighters, I'll pick one up and I put it away. And having just a way to start fire, fire will cook your food. It'll boil your water <clears> if you need to drink it. Uh, it will, And that's one thing, too, about it is it, you can boil water to make it drinkable. Only thing is, it takes a lot of energy. It does, you know, whether right. it's wood or propane <clears throat> or whatever, and it will give you heat. It'll give you light, and it will keep predators at bay, and just be a more general morale if you need just having a nice fire. So fire kits are very important, um, and they can go out. Uh, but also a not a good fixed blade knife, or at least a good sturdy knife. Uh, having something that you can do where you can create some fire tinder to get your fire started to clean something, if you need to cook, cut something, whatever, a good knife. Uh, paracord is a great thing. There's so many uses with paracord. You can set up a shelter, uh, you know, with even using just materials yep. wherever. I mean, you can <clears throat> put logs together and tie them down and build yourself a shelter. So having just some basic survival things, and of course, obviously, a medical kit would go good in there. Um, and then your your regular, you know, hygiene items yeah. and things like that. And, you know, for me, one of the biggest things with, with a fixed blade knife that's in my survival bag, I want whatever fixed blade knife that I'm carrying to have a guard on it to keep my hand from being able to slide up onto the blade. Yeah. If I'm if I'm stabbing something, if I'm cutting something, the number one thing that I want to do is protect myself and keep my hand away from the blade itself. One of the worst things that could happen to you in a survival situation is a really bad cut. And, you know, you could potentially cut ligaments and tendons and which would require, you know, a trip to the hospital and surgery. And in an emergency situation, that's that may not be an option. Right. So a good guard that's going to protect your fingers, keep your hand away from the blade itself while you're cutting things, I, I think is one of the most important things that a good fixed blade knife can have. And I'll just tell you guys, reviewing knives for years, mm -hmm. I have cut myself over and over and over. Uh, I mean, it is so easy to slip. And so, you know, be careful with a knife. And that's the thing about a hatchet. Yep. Uh, you know, having a hatchet, you may want to have a saw. Saws are really great because you're not as out to, to hit yourself or cut yourself. So having these items, just some emergency items in a bag. Now, you can buy these pre-made, but I recommend that you put your own together because you just get better quality stuff. Well, you know, it's kind of like buying a pre-made AR-15. You get it, your first AR, and you love it for a little while. And then you, you're like, well, I don't really like this buttstock. I don't like this grip. I don't like this muzzle device. I don't <laughs> like this trigger. I don't like the sights that are on it. Next thing you know, you've changed out everything on the rifle except for the, the upper and lower receiver and bolt carrier group. All right. Yeah. So you can, and then you end up more expensive than what you would have been if you would have just built exactly what you wanted to start. Survival bags are the same way. Build it out with what you want in it and what fits you and your needs. But, you know, the thing is, is the truth of the matter is somebody that's maybe just unexperienced, mm -hmm. has no experience, they're just, they may go and buy a, a some bag. And, and we've done, I've done some reviews on those yeah. type bags, those pre-made bags. If you that's what you do, then when you get into it, and I highly recommend being familiar with it, 
then take the items that you don't. And of course, obviously it's going to be more expensive, mm -hmm. but uh, you can add those <clears> items in. So, you know, there are different ways to look at it. I agree though with what Robbie said <laughs> completely, but you know, the end of the day, even a, a pre-made bag is still better than nothing. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. If we have some questions, we'll go to a few and then um, we'll, we'll continue on. Uh, Bert asks question, should I buy a couple of cheap ARs or should I, I buy a couple of high end ARs? Funds aren't a problem. Well, well, I mean, this is the thing about an AR and I'll let Robbie expand on this, but the, the barrel and the bolt carrier group are the heart of the rifle. Mm -hmm. That is the most <clears throat> important part. And sometimes with the frou-frou stuff you get on there, I mean, you can buy a $3,600 AR. Or you can buy a Palmetto State Armory AR that's really good quality. I mean, the bolt carrier and the barrels, they have hammer forged barrels in some of their they some do. of their models. <clears throat> From FN. Yeah. yeah. I mean, those are excellent ARs. They will serve you just as well. But if you want the amenities of maybe an, you know, a, a really high end, if you're very particular about how you function your rifle, I think that's where that comes in. Yeah. For for me, as far as a uh I would go with the high-end rifles and I would go not only with the high-end rifles, but with a company that will put that rifle together exactly like I want the kind of buttstock that I want, the kind of trigger that I want, the kind of muzzle device and free float handguard that I want. That way, when I get it, it's exactly what I want. Um, but I, I, I agree hundred percent. A great barrel is imperative. You know, if you're looking at it as a defensive rifle, Look for something with a chrome-lined hammer-forged barrel, uh, either the FN barrels, uh, BCM barrels, Daniel Defense barrels. Those are, I think, some of the best on the market. Uh, a great trigger, single stage or two stage, your preference, whatever you prefer. I'm a single stage guy. A lot of people like the two stage. Uh, and then the buttstock that fits you. A free float handguard that is going to allow you to attach different uh, accessories and then a muzzle device that's either going to help reduce recoil and muzzle rise, or that's going to be able to allow you to attach a suppressor to it. Right. So it's really kind of two different ways to look at it. it. You know, yep. I mean, if you're very experienced with an AR-15, that, that's to me, and, and I am, I'm very experienced. Yep. But if someone just comes out and goes, you know what, I just want a couple of rifles. I, I think your basic rifles, and for those who don't have the funds to right. do that, I think it's important to, you know, if you can buy, but don't buy a cheap, the cheapest thing you can find out on the market. But I will say, and I've been down to Palmetto State Armory, which they're some of the most basic budget friendly ARs on the market. They do a fantastic job they do. with their barrels and their bolt carrier groups and their mil spec. So the, the reason why their prices are so low is because they sell direct. Direct to consumer. Yeah, yeah. And that's the big thing. But, you know, either way, I think it's more of just your preferences. It is. If that's important. Triggers are very important to me and Robbie. Very important. Because we've had a lot of experience and we know about, we can get better accuracy with a good trigger. But, uh, but yeah, I, I think it's, you know, I, I think if I had the money, I would go with the better rifle. Mm -hmm. Uh, Anthony Taws asks, love to hear some advice, pros and cons on property, land, home purchases for preppers and gun enthusiasts. Well, let me, I'll tell you, because we've, we have a piece of property here, but we, we've been looking for a bigger piece of property. And, and so is Robbie. We, yep. They've been looking and, and yet we've stepped back a couple of times and gone, ah, let's do with what we have because we do have some potential. But a couple of, of cautions with property especially if it's out, way out. And it's one of the things that happened with the economic collapse down in Argentina, which I went ahead and brought this book out because I knew I was going to mention it. Uh, the Modern Survival Guide for the Coming Economic Collapse. This was written about actual events that happened in Argentina. Excellent. There's a link down below in the description to help you find it. But um, one of the things that Fafal said, who wrote the book, is that people that had cabins and bug out locations and they had them up in the mountains because they saw the writing on the wall. Mm -hmm. Well, they went to those locations and gangs and cartels and everybody else followed them up there and stripped them and killed them, raped, murdered, whatever. So, you know, unless you have a very good security team, and it's one of the things we're seeing down in South Africa right now with the farmers that are out in the middle of nowhere and these mobs will come and they'll kill the farmers and take the property. So if you're way out in the middle of nowhere, you better have a a group that is willing to stand in together. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things they do in South Africa is they have these reaction teams. And so the local farmers, they can make one call and this team will come together and they'll come to their aid. 
So just one big thing to consider when you're we're thinking about bugging out, because let's face it, there is nowhere that's safe from crime, especially with our drug problems, because you've got drug people that are on drugs in every city of every state in the yep. country. So I would, but also look at your property and see if it's, it's defendable and, and maybe the neighborhood, if, if it's a good neighborhood or people that do live around you, can you work with them and, and work together? And what type of soil does it, you know, on the, you want to know what type of soil it has. Is it the soil conducive to growing crops? Is the soil conducive to raising animals on it? Do you have a water source? Uh, all of those are to me really important things when you're looking for a piece of property. If it doesn't have a water source on it, I, I, I wouldn't even consider it. No. Um, if or at least something right nearby. Right, right. If the property, if the, the soil isn't good for growing crops, you know, you're going to have a hard time with your property. You've got to be able to grow crops if you're if this is you're looking at it as a long term bug out situation. One thing we were looking at one piece of property which we were really thinking about buying, and mm -hmm. there was a, a a railroad track on one of the borders of the property, and we were noticing that we noticed it later, and we were like, wait a minute, if that's a railroad track, you know, what kind of chemicals are traveling on that mm -hmm. track? What kind of maybe even <clears throat> nuclear waste because there's a nuclear power plant in South Carolina yep. that could take waste right up through there. What if there's a derailment? So there are things like that to really research and make sure before you do purchase. Yeah. Interstates and highways. What's the the closest big road to your property? How easily accessible is your property to other people? What kind of neighbors do you have around the property? You know, before you buy a property that has other people that live around it, go and meet some of the people that live around you and see what kind of mindset they have. Right. And see if it's, you know, if they would be good people that you wanted for neighbors or if there's somebody that, that you wouldn't want for a neighbor. Right. Let's go for one more and then we'll continue. Uh, T. Isley asks, what are your thoughts on antibiotics and medications for SHTF and are animal meds and antibiotics safe for humans? Yes. Um, most of the antibiotics that are uh, being produced are can be produced for animals as well. Uh, and they're on the same lines a lot of times. They even have mm -hmm. the same markings. They're just marketed differently. Uh, now, but here's the caveat. Uh, you can you may be allergic to certain antibiotics. It may be an antibiotic that doesn't treat what your problem is. So uh, my wife's an RN and she is for 20 years and, you know, she even can do research, but you've got to do a lot of research. And then what is your ailment? You're self-diagnosing yourself. So, you know, it can be, there's a lot that's around that. Uh, one thing that we do is colloidal silver. We've been doing that for years and it's a really good antibiotic and it does a lot of stuff. And for us, I'm not recommending that because if you do, YouTube will shoot, shut us <laughs> down. But um, it's one thing that we've used. It's used in the medical industry uh, in a lot of different areas. So that is one thing. And we can produce it at home, which we do. It's very simple to produce. And you want to have a little meter to be able to test the, the parts per million that are the, of the silver in your, in your water. But that is one thing. Uh, and then, of course, antibiotic ointments and things like that are going to be really important. One thing I do want to mention, too, is you want to have a lot of galls, <clears throat> lots of galls. Yep. If you have an injury and you're not able to get treatment, that that gauze is going to have to be need to be replaced over and over. And so make sure that you have a good supply of gauze. And there's some resources out there as well that you can order uh, antibiotics online and have antibiotic kits shipped to your house. So I would I do a little research on those and look at some of the different companies that you can order antibiotic kits uh, to have at home that you can that are made for humans that you can you can order online. Okay, good. Let's go to uh, the next is we talked about survival bags last. And I think that's a very important thing. Mm -hmm. I, one thing I do want to mention about survival bags is each of my family members has a get home bag in their car and we call it get home bag. It's just those same supplies that you're going to need, but it just makes sure that if you get stranded somewhere or some problem happens or something that you can take that bag and you have items that you need right there with you. Uh, but we're going to talk about a car kit. And so a, a bag would be great. In fact, I would recommend, uh, unless you live in a high crime area where people are stealing stuff out of your vehicles, which we have had that around here. Um, but we, we keep our doors locked, our car doors locked. But mm -hmm. otherwise, if you don't, they'll get right in it. So having a car bag that's secured, but your regular tools, 
you know, that you might need, um, you know, a, a bit, a warm blanket, yep. especially this time of year, uh, is having some kind of blanket because even in the summertime, uh, you can get wet and have some issues and then you can be stranded. And then a blanket is awesome to have in a vehicle or even emergency space blanket type thing. That's right. Uh, a good pair of boots is something that you need to keep in your car kit. And, you know, this time of year, it's getting colder. Ba jumper cables. Jumper cables are a big one. If your battery in your car is starting to get a little bit weak, when you have cold weather, it's going to highlight it. You're going to go to get in your car. Uh, speaking from experience, my oldest son just had this last week. He called me from school and said, hey, dad, my car won't start. Battery's dead. And, uh, you know, it's it's getting to be that time of year. Batteries start to wear out. It gets cold and the battery quits working on you. So having some jumper cables in your car where you can get your vehicle started in an emergency if you need to. Know how to access your battery, where it's at, how to hook the cables up correctly. Those are all important things that you need to know. And two, I have one thing that's just, it's a diehard. It's this battery backup mm -hmm. thing that's a quick yep. charge. And you can hook <clears> it up and actually it helps start the car. It gives it that boost to get your car started. One so, thing with those though, and I've, I'm the same way. I've got one of those. You need to take it out of your vehicle periodically and charge check the charge it. on it and recharge <laughs> it. <laughs> you sure do. Because it, it doesn't help you at all if you've got a dead battery and you pull that out and that battery is dead also. But, you know, having your just some needed supplies in there. And one of the things about the bag, which makes it nice, is that if you put the, the bag in your car and you keep it in there, mm -hmm. then then if you need it, you're at, inside the house, you can come get it. But if you leave it in the house and you're out somewhere, you don't have those supplies. Yep. So having some basic survival supplies, uh, just put back a fire kit, you know, a, a knife, some things, even a small saw, because sometimes you can have like the tornadoes that happen. That's right. You may end up having to do some cutting. It may not be a big, huge log, but it may just be some branches that are in the way. And so this will give you a way to be able to cut. But just having some basic things, a flashlight, uh, you know, a, um, a multi-tool. Just some things that you're going to use on a regular basis. Again, you don't have to go out and buy just a ton of survival supplies. Medical kit, having a medical kit in your car. And that goes really, that should be in everybody's Every car. Vehicle. Yep. I mean, you can get in, you know, have a wreck in no time. And so car kit, having those extra things. Uh, socks to go with those boots, yep. which I know you're big about. <clears throat> yes. Having some extra socks in there uh, as well. And it, really, if you get stranded, you can put that extra pair of socks over your socks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then that goes to our next one. Number six was shoes. But even at home, making sure that you have some some boots or some kind of sturdy shoes. A lot of times, hey, dudes just aren't going to make it. Or, <laughs> or Crocs or, you know, flip-flops. Uh, the different kind of shoes. Maybe it's dress shoes. Make sure that you have a good pair of sturdy boots or shoes mm -hmm. uh, in case you need them because you need to preserve your ankles and getting over debris and any kind of thing like that that you might need in an emergency situation. And, you know, I've been a big fan of the the Merles for yes. decades. And uh, there's what I'm wearing right now. But yeah. they, are, they are one of my favorite pair of outdoor hiking shoes. And uh, I take them and scotch guard them really, really heavily two or three times. So they're waterproof and, uh, you know, it keeps the water out, keeps them from getting stained and everything. And it helps them to last quite a bit longer. But it keeps your feet dry and that's important. It does. Yeah. Yes, it does. But the the Merles are one of my favorites. Not not sponsored or anything, but uh, <laughs> just throwing that out there. You know, if you're looking for what my personal favorite is, it's the Merles. Yeah, I have a pair of Merles and uh, that I was actually I don't have them on today, but I was wearing them yesterday because I was going I was doing some backpack review mm -hmm. stuff. And I was out in the woods and man, having a good pair of boots or good pair of shoes is vital. Uh, but those Merrells are my, they're my favorites as well. I, I have a, a, the pair I have, and it's funny because they're one that you can actually slip your feet into. It's a half boot mm -hmm. and you can slip your feet into them and then strap them up. It's real easy to put on, yep. you know? <laughs> so I like that as well. Maybe that's why I like them yeah. so much. <laughs> um, having some rain gear. And guys, I know a lot of times, you know, for me, typically it's got to really be raining for me to have a rain jacket. I, I'm, I'll just slip in and out of places, you know, if it's raining. Uh, but, you know, and some people have umbrellas and things, but having a good rain jacket and even rain pants. That's right. Uh, and again, wearing shoes that are somewhat waterproof and Scotch Guard would definitely does help with that. Yep. So getting yourself some rain, because the one thing you don't want to do is to get, exposed to just being wet 
and then getting cold and then going into some kind of hyperthermia or something like that, especially in the cold weather, but even in the summertime. Uh, my brother does a lot of fishing. He's a big fly fisherman and he goes all over the place. In the middle of summer, he's down in Florida at the Everglades. And at night, when it gets really, the temperatures can get down a little bit. But if you're mm -hmm. really wet, yep. I mean, you can catch pneumonia, you can get really sick. So having some kind of rain gear to protect yourself in the rain. Well, you know, it's it's a whole lot easier to stay warm than it is to try and warm yourself back yeah. up after you get cold. That's true. Okay, number eight is hygiene. Now, we're talking about, which falls into that, toilet paper. Mm -hmm. You know, we saw what happened to toilet paper. That was really strange to me. Gotta, it still is strange. You got to keep the crap clean. But you got to keep that clean. <laughs> There's not really a lot of substitutes. Uh, so, you know, having toilet paper, having, you know, some soap. One thing about any kind of emergency situation is you can get dirty because you're having to do things that you don't normally do. Yep. You're kind of getting in there and working on things. But hygiene is extremely vital. Uh, during the Civil War, more people died from dysentery than they did from actually violence from bullets. So making sure that you stay clean. You know, it's funny. You see these dystopian kind of movies and it's, mm -hmm. you know, and some kind of SHTF situations happen and they just all dirty and their clothes yeah. are dirty and they're going around <clears throat> dirty, you know, and which could happen. Well, you know, but, you watch some of these survival shows that are on TV, like that show alone is a really good example. And in the beginning, everybody's they're they're washing, they're taking showers, they're taking care of themselves, you know, keeping up with their hygiene toward the middle to the end of the show. They are grungy, nasty, dirty, filthy. They've let their hygiene slip. They're not taking care of themselves. And when that starts happening, a lot of the people on that show end up getting kicked off because they get sick. Nah, right, right. And it's it comes back to your hygiene. You're not you're not taking care of yourself. You're not keeping yourself clean. You're contaminating your food. You're contaminating your water. You end up getting sick, and then you. On a show, it's easy. You get kicked off. You get medical treatment. You're fine. In an SHTF situation, you know, you die. Right, right. So, you know, and hygiene also like toothpaste, keeping your teeth clean mm -hmm. or just having some. You know, it could just be, you know, a situation to where you're, you're at home and everything's fine. You're not really all that dirty, but you need to keep up with your hygiene yep. because, you know, you could go a week without being able to brush your teeth if you don't have that extra toothpaste. Uh, and dental floss, the things that you need and the things that you use on a regular basis mm -hmm. and feminine hygiene <clears throat> products, very important to have some of that put back. So different items just to have put back that you typically use, just get a few extras. Uh, I do a subscription to what, Dr. Squatch. What's your recommendation for a feminine products? Well, you know, <laughs> let's see. what I like is for them to do it and I don't mess with it. <laughs> Oh, Robbie. Um, but yeah, that's, you know, having those kind of <laughs> items are important. Okay. Um, number nine is power. And when I say power, I'm, and I'm talking about a limited kind of deal is mm -hmm. having your battery backups, yep. you know, having your power banks, have them charged. Make sure you keep your power banks charged, just like we talked about with the starter, uh, the, uh, the jump start. Uh, little box is keeping things charged up. Um, whenever there's a big storm coming in or there's, you know, threats of maybe a tornado or something, we make sure that all of our battery backups are charged. Yep. And we go, we immediately do that. We make sure our flashlights are charged. We make sure our phones are charged. So go ahead when, when any kind of situation, just make sure if you do have power, but there's threat that you may lose power, make sure that certain items are being charged. So when the power does go out, you're at a full charge. Uh, and of course, having batteries, just having extra batteries. Uh, we have something called the battery daddy and it's this case and it has, you can put batteries in mm -hmm. it and we rotate them out. And so we use them. If we need batteries, we go use them and then we fill it back up, but it keeps batteries right there all along. And batteries actually last a pretty good long time. They do. One thing that I do with my battery daddy is when I put batteries in there, I write the date on the batteries. No, that's good. Uh, let's take a Sharpie and I write the date on the batteries. That way I know which ones are my oldest, which ones are my newest. And as I pull batteries from it, it's always the first in, first out method. The first batteries that go in, which are the oldest, are the first ones to come out that I use and then replace. 
But let's face it, guys, you can use batteries for so many things. Oh, and of, yes. Of course, with the rechargeable systems, a lot of times, you know, it, it makes it a little bit more difficult. And a lot of those lights, though, will take your standard batteries. So figuring that out. And I highly recommend having a flashlight that uses just regular double A batteries mm -hmm. or, you know, not necessarily D cell or C cell because they get huge. But that that's also an option. But having some batteries put back. Uh, even, uh, well, with LEDs, you don't have to really worry about bulbs. They have such a long uh, life. And so uh, if you can hear some noise, we've got somebody out there with a leaf blower, uh, which seems to be all over the place. All right. <laughs> so battery backup power. Now you can go with a generator and let's just say, you know what, you're, you're at home and you want to have some kind of power, you know, if your power goes out, especially during the winter time. So making sure that you have some gasoline or propane mm -hmm. or however you fuel. Whatever your generator runs on. Yep. And if you have a, you know, let's say you have a fireplace, but you don't really use it. You know, it's just there. And sometimes you'll, you'll build a fire, but you don't count on it. Putting together some firewood, which is not all that expensive. Having your firewood put back in case. It's one thing we do. We have a, quite a bit of firewood put back. So if we need firewood, we can use it. And, and that gives us another option. And one of the big things with a fireplace, too, is having it serviced and maintained, have mm. it cleaned annually, and have it inspected to make sure there's no cracks or anything in it that sparks can get out into your house and start a house fire. So make sure if you do have a fireplace that you have it cleaned and inspected annually. And then number 10 is self-defense. Uh, and, you know, guys, there's non-lethal self-defense. There is more lethal, serious self-defense. Obviously, we're big about self-defense with a gun. Uh, we think it's a very important. It is the it is the pinnacle of your self-defense options uh, as far as the top. And it's the great equalizer. But having a firearm is just a, a great way to protect your family and yourself. Uh, and then, of course, non-lethal options are, you know, pepper spray, Really, that's to me one of the best non-lethal mm -hmm. options yep. uh, because, you know, anything you're going to use with your hand, you've got to use force, brute force. Uh, you know, you're going to you may be going against two or three people. Uh, that's not going to really do you a heck of a lot of good uh, as much as others. Uh, or you may want to get into some martial arts classes or some fitness classes, uh, which, you know, that again takes you out of your norm, possibly. When it's one of the big things, whether it's uh, lethal force or non-lethal force, whatever you're using, get the training so you're proficient with whatever tool it is that you're using. Right. And self-defense can happen at any time. That's right. That can be, again, a personal SHTF situation, being robbed, being mugged, being attacked. You know, that can happen. So, uh, but And then also, if you do have a firearm, make sure that you do have some adequate ammunition and cleaning supplies so you can keep it maintained, but then you have the extra ammo. We've seen this over and over where there's political situations that happen and all of a sudden the shelves disappear of ammo. So make sure you have a couple of boxes at least. Um, obviously, I would recommend, you know, at least a thousand rounds, but realistically, if you're not a, you're, you're new to firearms or you just happen to have one that you keep in your closet or whatever, and maybe the only ammunition you have is what's in the magazine or what's in the cylinder. Get you a couple of extra boxes and take it out and try it. Go out and just shoot it. And it, it can be a lot of fun, mm -hmm. but it'll also give you an idea of how it's going to react to, you know, when you have to shoot it. If you are if you have no experience, it's very important to do that. OK, if we have a few more questions, we'll, we'll take them. Uh, Gary Hernandez, self-defense and urban survival yeah. ask. Hello, gentlemen. My question is, if you own one, do you carry with you a bulletproof backpack? Thanks. One thing I do is I have a panel, and it just stops handgun ammunition, mm -hmm. but I do have a panel <clears throat> that I keep in my backpack, and I also have one that I keep in my computer bag. Uh, and it just gives me some protection in case there's something going on. So, yes, I highly recommend that. It same. doesn't add any weight hardly to the pack. Yep, I'm, just, I'm the exact same way. My backpack, my the very back of it, it has a slot where I can put a water bladder. It's got a plate in there. And I can wear it on my back. Or if I need, if I'm in a defensive situation, I can flip my backpack around and put it on my front. Right. And then I've got a plate in my front as well. So again, it's that's not rifle protection. If somebody pulls out a rifle and starts going, best thing to do is get out of dodge. I but got, I got a level four plate. Oh, mine. excuse me. 
<laughs> Bobby's a big guy. You carry that big old thing. And they're coming out with better and better yeah. options. But yes, <clears throat> I highly recommend doing that. And, you know, kind of a, a neat little segue into that. That's one of the things I'm going to be talking about on my live tonight over on Robbie Wheaton is body armor and the new uh, the new schedule that the NIJ is using to rate body armor. They're completely changing their rating system for all body armor. And uh, starting January 1, 2024, they've got a new rating system that they're coming out with. They're adding some different categories to it. And they're following a lot more of what the military is using as far as how they rate body armor. So that's going to be part of the discussion tonight on my YouTube channel. Yeah, that's going to be interesting. Okay. Uh, Iberian Link Survival says, hey, guys, greetings from Portugal. What get home bag items would you advise to a complete stranger to prepping? Well, you know, there's the rule of threes. And so first off, and that's how I base all of my survival things. Uh, you have three minutes without air. So maybe having something to cover your face, you know, not necessarily a respirator or anything, but you want something for smoke and debris. Uh, and then we have uh, three hours in harsh conditions. This is how long you can live. So three hours in harsh conditions. I want to make sure I have something to keep me warm, keep my body temperature at a good level and dry and dry. Yep. And so, you know, maybe a, a space blanket, <clears throat> but get something that has a little more substance to it. Uh, SOL makes some great space bivvies and different things that are a little bit more sturdy. Uh, and then you have three days without water. So we want to make sure we have a water, uh, possibly a filter, because uh, if we're on the go and it's in a bag, you can't carry but so much water. So in a, a good container with that water filter. Uh, and then food is three weeks without food. So you've got some time, but you're going to not have a lot of energy mm -hmm. and food's going to be a good source to keep you going. Uh, and so those are the big things that I like to make sure of first. Cordage is very important. Yep. A good knife, uh, big, a good fixed blade knife is the best. Yep. But a good knife, having some medical and your self-defense flow in between. You could need medical at any point. You could need self-defense at any point. And so those are really just the basics. And a fire kit is vital because, you again, boil your water, cook your food, keep you warm, give you light keep predators away. I mean, it's, it's yep. just the one thing that to me, a fire kit is a very essential part of that. Yep. And then extra socks and a tarp are two really big ones for me. Tarp, keep you dry, keep you covered up, place to sleep. You can use your cordage to tie it up, make a makeshift uh, shelter, extra socks to keep your feet dry. You know, you take a wet pair of socks off, you hang them on your backpack so they can dry out while you're walking. You put the dry socks back on and you rotate them in and out. So you always have a dry pair of socks on your feet. And and having a, a rain jacket, you may have said yep. this, but yep. having some kind of rain jacket that you can put in there that you can cover yourself. One thing I like to add is a couple of heavy meal trash bags. Mm -hmm. And they can be used for shelter, but there's a bazillion uses for uh, heavy meal trash bags. And with that first one, I like to have a bandana. A bandana you can put over your face, but you can also use it as a hobo sack on the end of a stick. You can, I mean, filter, pre-filter water. I mean, there's just tons of things you can yep. do with a bandana. So that's that's the, the short end. That's anyway, right. anything else you add, you know, you can add a multi-tool and things like that. But a lot of things you add are going to be more toward convenience. Uh, Susan Rary asked, question, when utilities shut down, what can we do to prevent sewage backup from backing up into our homes? Also, someone added, what about if you live on city and all that city sewer city water yep yuck <laughs> yeah <laughs> well we live on city water but not city sewage sewer um and so ours just drains down into a field um uh, wow you know that that's that could be a problem you know one thing i think and yeah i don't know how so you, if you you've think? got if you've got a uh if you have a septic tank one of the big things you, that you need to make sure is that you keep it pumped out on a regular basis um Household of four, you need to have your septic tank pumped every six or seven years. And it, it can vary a little bit depending on the size of your tank and, and how often it's being used. Um, that's one of the things we just had done a couple of weeks ago, had our had our septic tank pumped to keep it cleaned out. Uh, but if you're on if you're on city sewer and everything everything stops, it's not pumping the the waste away like it's supposed to, but really you need to have a shutoff under your house to where you can shut that valve and prevent anything from coming back in. Now it's going to prevent anything from going out, but if you don't have, um, 
if you don't have the pumping system that's flushing those those lines, you need to have a shutoff valve to keep anything from coming back into your house. And then you're going to have to look at an alternative method for disposing of your waste. Yeah, that's that's definitely we, we've done some stuff about um, about waste outside of good because you need to maintain that waste and you yep. need to be careful even with trash. Uh, you know, not disposing of it properly can cause a lot of disease, a lot of problems. Uh, one thing that uh, I did a video about this is took a five gallon bucket, put a plastic liner in it and then took a pool noodle and put it around and you right. can use the bathroom. Take kitty litter or something and you can put it in the bottom and then wrap it up and then bury it. Uh, that's not going to be great for the uh, the geo, you know naturalist mm -hmm. environmentalist but you know it is going to keep you from getting some kind of disease and if you have some land it's not a bad idea if your own city sewer but you have some land to put a composting toilet outside on your property that you can use in an emergency situation right so yeah but i, I think you're right i think just a shutoff valve of some sort would yep. be definitely something because you don't want that backing up into your house because then then that's going to cause a whole nother set of problems yes. not just the smell uh, King Tech 574 asks, is the PSA, uh, they are 15, or it says PA 15, but I don't know if they mean AR 15, reliable enough? Palmetto State Armory, I've got a number of Palmetto State Armory AR 15s. They're, they're solid. They're solid rifles. Yeah, the uh, big thing is just make sure you get one of the good barrels, a chrome lined hammer forged barrel, <clears throat> and then a bolt carrier group. I prefer Carpenter 158 for my bolts uh, over 9310. 9310 works and it works well, but I've seen some failures over the years out of 9310 where Carpenter 158 seems to last much longer and is much more durable for the bolt. Yeah. And again, the barrel and the bolt are the heart of your rifle. A lot of times PSA, when they do that, they'll, the barrel, it, they have an option for a, for a, a cold camera. A cold hammer forge barrel and it's an fn barrel yep. fn's right here in south <clears throat> carolina and i would opt for that yep. but to be honest with you just having a straight ar-15 uh from palmetto state armory it, it's they're they're good to go they are okay i think we must be out of time so uh we really appreciate you guys being here great questions uh, and i hope that this kind of just especially for those that are new and even guys I mean, even when I'm talking about this and we've been prepping for years, this helps to refresh me and to me to think about little holes that I might need to, to fix. Also, we really appreciate ExoTac. Again, you get 20% off using Such20 uh, with the link down below in the description. These are made down in Winder, Georgia. They do an incredible job. And having a fire kit is vital. It's vital for your bag. It's vital for home. Uh, again, it can boil your water, cook your food, give you light, give you heat keep predators at bay, and it just builds your morale. So we really appreciate that. There'll be a link down below in the description. Also, big thanks to Robbie Wheaton for being here um, and just, you know, helping out and keeping me in line. Uh, but also, he's doing his live tonight. Make sure you go tune in. What time is that again? Uh, 6 o'clock Eastern Standard. 6 o'clock Eastern Standard. Again, there'll be a link down below in the description that'll take you straight to his channel. And we want to thank Sarah Mack for monitoring the questions and the comments and uh getting those questions to us and helping us also to set up. But guys, make sure that you do have some supplies put aside. You don't have to be on National Geographic's Doomsday Preppers, uh, but you can put some things together. And again, the big thing is it just gives you more time, which will lead to giving you more rational uh, choices if you're facing this kind of situation. So be strong, be of good courage. God bless America. Long live the Republic.